I want to share a short little story with you. It happened to me just last night. Kind of, kind of strengthened what I wanted to teach you this morning. Uh, I was in my office. We had an office at home. And I was in my office and I was typing on the computer. And you know me, I, we've got a son that can sit down at a computer and just go, there's two pages though. I'm one of them guys that does two fingers. Tap, 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 tap. It could take me a half an hour to type out two paragraphs. And I'm so thankful for a thing that's called spell check. Does anybody in here know what a spell check is? Because by the time my half hour is over and I've only typed two paragraphs, when I look up at the screen, it looks more like a Christmas tree than it does a document that I'm trying to type. Most of it is written in red. That lets me know I've misspelled it. And what's not written in red is underlined in green. That lets me know that my southern grammar is coming out and there's a better way of saying it. And I'm so very thankful that I can just take that mouse and click on the green and click on the correct and boom, it'll be in the language that y'all can understand. And I can take that mouse and I can click on the red and then click on the fix and boom, it'll correct all of my misspelled words. And so by the time you get a copy of from the pastor's desk, it doesn't look like it looked in its original form. And then I thought to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful if life came with spell check? I mean, think about that. Wouldn't it be a great thing if all we had to do was click a button and all of our mistakes were taken care of? I would love to have spell check for life. Would you? You know, I've gotten it wrong before. I've dropped the ball. I've, I've made my mistakes. I've committed my sins. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just move the mouse around a little bit and click here and click here and boom, everything just be made right? Do you know it's possible that you can make it right? Yeah. You don't need spell check. You got Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 He is the propitiation for our sins. Amen. He is the mediator between God and man. When we get it wrong, we can go to Jesus Christ and make it right. He's our spell check. He's our advocate with the Father. Yeah. I want us to understand something. The scripture teaches us that in Proverbs 24, 16, a just man falls seven times and rises up again. Say this with me again. Good people make bad decisions. Say it again. Good people make bad decisions. One more time so we got it. Good people make bad decisions. Sometimes we make bad choices. Sometimes we make bad decisions. It doesn't mean that we're bad, wicked people. I'm going to show you some people in the Scripture this morning that got it wrong. I'm going to show you some people in the Scripture this morning that made some bad choices. I'm going to show you in the scripture that your failure does not surprise God. How many times? Have you ever done something wrong and you thought, oh man, I hope God did <laughs> You ain't surprising God. God created you. He knows what you're capable of. I'm not watering it down. We're going to get, we're going to get heavy. We're going to get thick into this here in just a moment. But you need to understand that whatever you do, whatever you say, you ain't surprising God at all. He knows what man's capable of. That's why he sent his son into this world to believe and die that we might have a way to attain salvation. A way of forgiveness. No matter how many times you fail, no matter how many times you get it wrong, no matter how many times you sin, you can trust God to help you and to give you the wisdom and the knowledge and the strength and the courage to move forward. I think sometimes we just get we just get stunned. Something happens in our lives and we think, my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And we feel so rotten about it that that we either we either just wallow around in our guilt and our shame or we shut it off to the side and go, 
a moment for 15, 20 years. Never learning how to let go. Never learning how to deal with the problem in their life. They just feel like, well, I messed up so bad. There ain't no hope for me. I'm going to get any better than this. I guess I'm just going to stay right where I'm at. Friend of the Lord doesn't want that for you. And He doesn't want that in your life. He wants you to be able to, to trust Him. He wants you to be able to have faith in Him and in His ability to for not only to forgive you, but to restore you. And give you the courage and the wisdom to move forward. The best response to failure is to get up again and to ask God what lessons you need to learn through this painful situation. The Scripture says, the scripture says that a just man will fall seven times. So don't get it in your head that you're going to live this life perfectly and never get it wrong, and never make a mistake, never commit a sin, never have to fall on your face before God and repentance again. Because that's a lie from the devil. There is only one perfect man. His name is Jesus Christ. And you ain't him. Alright? Don't lose hope in the God who promises you the ultimate victory for eternal life. We're going to discover this morning we're going to discover this morning that there are some biblical heroes who have gotten it totally, totally wrong. Abraham told people that his wife Sarah was his sister. Do you remember reading that in the scripture? Sarah was not his sister. But Abraham because there was some men that was looking upon Sarah and thought Sarah was a mighty good looking woman. Abraham thought, well, they're going to kill me and take her as their slave. So in order to save my wife's life, I'm just going to tell a lie. This is Abraham, the father of our faith. He's known as the father of faith because he trusted God. So he told these men, that's not my wife, we're not married. This is my sister. Abraham did that. You all know how that turned out. He wound up having to face the lie that he told. He wound up telling the truth of the men. The very men that he was afraid of reacted totally different than what Abraham thought they would act. They said, well, you should have told us that she was your wife. We wouldn't have done the things we got. Teaches us that we need to just be honest in the first place. Don't worry about that, baby. I'm a Baptist. I can get louder. <laughs> Moses was so frightened because he had committed murder that he realized that everyone knew what he had done. Moses did that. Shortly before being banished out of Egypt and winding up on the backside of the desert taking care of Jethro's sheep, Moses actually standing up for one of his Hebrew brothers committed a crime of murder. He tried to cover it up. Can I tell you, you can't cover up your sin. That's a principle that we need to learn. You can't cover up your sin. The only thing you can do with your sin is to deal with it, to face it, repent of it, and ask to be forgiven. Moses tried to cover it up. You can't cover something like that. I'd say he, I'd say, I'd say Moses got, got it wrong there. David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. King David. So can I tell you that there ain't nobody exempt from failure? <coughs> can I tell you there ain't anybody? See, spell check would have just kicked in right there, wouldn't it? <laughs> there isn't anybody who is exempt from failure. Even heroes of the Bible, such as Abraham, Moses, and David. And we are going to see here in just a moment, the Apostle Peter had first-hand experience with failure. So if you're sitting here in the church house this morning and you're thinking, my goodness, I should have stayed home today because Thad's going Thad's to gonna sit right down on my lap here tonight. 
I need you to understand something. I've been where you're at. And more importantly, Moses has been where you're at. And Abraham has been where you're at. And David has been where you're at. There's nobody exempt from this thing. And just because you made some bad choices doesn't make you a bad person. We need to learn how to receive the Lord's healing. We need to learn how to receive the Lord's grace. And those are the things we're going to look at this morning. Jesus was the only man on earth who ever led a truly perfect life, but he was God. Fortunately, failure is not fatal. <laughs> I love that. It does not mean you are substandard. It only means that you're human. What you learn from your failure is what really counts. So let's see what we can learn today. Read with me, if you will, in the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him to the high priest's house. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about Jesus. They have come to take Jesus to try him and to crucify him. Luke 22, 54. They took him, they led him, and brought him into the high priest's house. If you're with me in the scripture, I want you to read this. It doesn't matter if you're reading King James or if you're reading New International. Just read whatever's written in your Bible. And Peter followed afar off. Can I tell you there are some things that will happen in your life that will lead up to you committing the sin? There are some things that will happen in your life that will lead up to you making the bad decision. There are some things in your life that will lead up to you making the wrong choices. And if we can learn to identify what those things are before we commit the sin, or before we make the mistake, then it will throw a red flag up before us and we'll say, oh, I've already learned about this. I need to steer clear from that. And the first thing that I want to point out to you here, and it may be a principle of life, is that Peter followed him afar off. It amazes me that when we distance ourselves from the Lord, we want to go getting closer to the world. Does that... Have you ever noticed that? Maybe you're here this morning and you feel a distance between you and God. Maybe you feel a distance between you and the Lord. Can I tell you something? It wasn't the Lord who backed off of you. It wasn't the Lord who said, I need a break from Him. It wasn't the Lord that said, my goodness, she's about to drive me nuts. I'm going to go. God doesn't do that. If there's a distance between you and God, it's not that God distanced himself from you. It's that you distanced yourself from God. Do you know that the scripture teaches us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 30, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's a promise. Yeah. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. <laughs> this ain't got anything at all to do with the message this morning, but it reminded me of a young man I was ministering to. He was probably 18 or 19 years old, and he was getting ready to take off on a youth outing, and, and they were going to travel to some other city. And there was one thing he wanted to do more than anything when he got to this place. For $150, you could go up in a plane, they would put a parachute on you, and you could jump out of a plane. And he was telling me about this. And he was bragging about it. I said, what in the world would possess you to want to jump out of an airplane? He said, oh, I think it would be, I think it would be the greatest thing. I said, I think you're making a mistake. He said, you're a preacher. Don't you believe that? There's an appointed time for man to die. And after this, the judgment, I said, yeah, I, I believe that. He 
said, well, if it's not my appointed time, then I'm going to have fun jumping out of that plane. If it is my appointed time, I'm going to die one way or the other. I said, yeah, but the scripture also says not to tempt the Lord thy God. And Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. He didn't say nothing about how. <laughs> It's a promise that we have from Jesus Christ. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You have a promise that Jesus is not going to depart from you. Say this with me. Jesus will not leave me. Jesus will not leave me. Oh. 
cold in there, he would they would have built that fire. And Peter sits down among them and warms himself next to the enemy's fire. There's your proof. You distance yourself from the Lord, you're going to get closer to the world. You know, the Scripture teaches us... Uh, I want to read something to you. You don't, have to, you don't have to turn to it, but I, I want to read this to you. <clears throat> First John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if we want to be close to something, we want to be close to God. We don't want to be close to the world. We want to be close to the principles of God. We don't want to be close to the principles of the world. We want to be in fellowship with God. We don't want to be in fellowship with the world. But here's the problem. And every one of us is faced with it. We live in the world. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, the scripture also teaches us that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So while we are in this world, look for opportunities to serve God. Do you know Peter could have said in the midst of those people who chanted for the death of Jesus Christ and delivered a gospel message to them, and the Holy Spirit could have moved in their hearts and they could have seen their own wrongs, they could have seen their own sins, and felt the convicting power of the Holy Ghost of God, repented, and been saved. But instead, Peter got so far away from God that he got comfortable in the world. How do you know he got comfortable, Pastor, with that? Well, because it had to have been colder, they would not have lit that fire. And have you ever been outside on a chilly night and had a bonfire where I grew up out in the country? We, I lived so far back in the country when I was a kid, you had to pipe the sunlight in. And one of the coolest things in the summertime was in big old bonfires we used to have. Now we didn't have CD players in our pickup trucks like kids have today. You might not know, maybe, maybe this is how you do it, maybe it's not how you do it, but we used to, we used to take our cars and our pickup trucks and we'd, and we'd, and we'd just park them in a circle. And we'd open up all of our doors and we would play our eight track players. <laughs> Turn the music up. And just enjoy that bonfire. Sometimes the nights would get chilly. That bonfire would feel so good. Stand next to that fire and warm yourself. It's comfortable. Peter warmed himself next to the enemy's fire. He found comfort. He found comfort among those people. I don't want to keep pounding principle number one to you, but for some reason it keeps coming to me. Anytime you distance yourself from God, you will find comfort in the things of the world that the Scripture teaches us. You can find this in the book of James. Whoever is the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now what do we do with that? Because we live in the world. I don't know about you, but I've got a mortgage. I don't know about you, but I pay a light bill. I pay a water bill. I pay cell phone bills. I got insurance. I got taxes. I've got a job. My kid goes to school. She plays basketball with me. Volleyball with me. Cheerleading <laughs> So she keeps us running. We go out to eat. We order out. We bring it home. We sit at a table. We're around people. We have jobs. We have school. What are we supposed to do with a, with a scripture like that? What are we supposed to do with that? What we are supposed to do with that is what Peter was supposed to have done with that. To realize that you're a child of God. To realize that you have an eternal relationship with Him. To realize that no matter what the Republicans are doing, no matter what the Democrats are doing, no matter what the third party is doing, you don't have to follow that. To realize that whatever, whatever your co-workers are doing doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do that. It doesn't mean you've got to be an old stick in the mud either. 
doesn't mean that you've got to be uh, a, a, a brother better than you. Sometimes that even Christians have their nose so high up in the air. They can't help anybody because they can't see anybody because all they're doing is walking around like that. We need to realize that but for the grace of God go I. Amen. I used to be lost, now I'm found. I used to be blinded, but now I see. I'm no better than you, you're no better than I am. And we ain't no better than a lost and a dying world. We used to be there, but for the grace of God we've been saved. There's opportunities. I'm not telling you to fellowship. I'm not telling you to friendship. I'm not telling you to hang out and go where they go and do what they do. I am telling you that you're the ambassador of Jesus Christ. And your testimony has a powerful tool in the hand of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It can draw the wickedest of sinners to come to know God. So we need to drop the religion. We need to drop the judgmentalism. We need to be children of God in our homes, not just in our churches. We need to be children of God in our workplaces, not just in our homes. You are a child of God 24 hours a day, seven days. If you're awake, you're a child of God. If you're asleep, you're a child of God. And there's opportunities, friend. Opportunities for you to give God honor and glory with the life that He's given you today. Peter could have done that. Peter could have sat down among them. Peter could have warmed himself by the fire. And Peter could have stood for Jesus Christ, but he didn't. How do you know that? Let's read on. Look at verse 56. But a certain man beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. She recognized Peter. You know people recognize you? I know him. He's one of the guys that follow Jesus Christ. You know people know that about him? You don't have to tell it. I see people with these business cards walking around handing people business cards that says I'm a child of God. Walk around handing people business cards saying I'm a preacher. You want to know something? If you've got a hand, if a preacher has to hand somebody a business card to let them know he's a preacher, he's probably not a very good one. If a Christian has to hand somebody a business card that says, I'm a Christian, they're probably not a very good one. Being a Christian, you don't have to go around telling it on yourself. It will tell on you. Why? Because you've been born again. You're no longer who you used to be. You have the power of God living and dwelling on the inside of you. That makes a difference in the world that you're living in. <laughs> she recognized Peter. She said, you're one of them. And he denied him. You want to talk about making a mistake? You want to talk about getting it wrong? I think Peter just got it wrong. Well, I don't know him. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you? She looked him up and she looked him down. She looked at the way he was dressed. She looked at his hands. She looked at his feet. She looked at his eyes. She noticed his face. She said, there's something very familiar about this guy. Who is I can't. I know. I know where I've seen you before. You were with she just a few days ago when Jesus came into town riding that donkey and all them people were laying palm leaves out in front of them and taking their coats off. Yeah. That's where I see you. You were with him. You're one of them. Oh, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know that God. You know what? I feel almost condemned just preaching this message and repeating the things that Peter said. I mean, he didn't just he didn't just forget to set the alarm clock. He didn't just forget to put gas in it car and you know now I'd make a stop on the way to work it's gonna be three minutes late. He when Peter messed up, Peter messed up. Out of all of the things that me and you together could have done, I don't know if it gets any worse than saying, please, I don't even know who he is. You know Jesus would never do that to you. 
But our actions sometimes speak those very words. Lord, forgive us. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. I know, I know you just rebuked her and told you you don't know her, but I've seen you too. You are one of them. And he said, Man, I am not. Wow, this is the second time now that Peter has denied Jesus Christ. And I know what y'all are thinking. Jesus, Jesus told Peter he was going to do that. Before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. That's the prophecy that Jesus, that Jesus gave to Peter. It doesn't make it right. It just shows that Jesus knew. You know Jesus knows? You know Jesus knew that about Peter, but he loved Peter anyway? You know Jesus knows that about you? But he loves you anyway. Hey man, that ought to put you on shopping ground. We ought to be in revival right now to know that we can get it so wrong, but that Jesus still loves us. <laughs> Glory to God. In about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet speak, the cock grew. The cock grew. Now I want you to pay very close attention to verses 61 and 62. I think I can preach for two weeks on these two verses. I won't do that to you. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. You know that while Jesus was going through what Jesus was going through, he loved Peter enough to have Peter in his sight. That blesses me. I don't know what it does to your heart, but that blesses me to know that when Jesus was suffering, he loved me more than his suffering. And he kept me in his sight. When Jesus is busy running this whole world and taking care of this whole universe, He loves me enough to watch out for my everyday movements in my everyday life. Amen. That blesses me, friend. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. We've already said this. I don't need to sit down on it any longer, but Jesus sees and Jesus knows, but He loves you anyway. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. Now that's powerful. It's another principle. We're going to get to that. How he said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And Peter went out. Peter wept bitterly. Jesus looked upon Peter. Jesus knows, but he still loves us. It was, it was a look of love. I've heard some preachers and some teachers talk about how that Jesus peered through Peter with piercing eyes. How that Jesus... How did Jesus look upon Peter with great disdain because of what Peter had done? But I don't agree with that. I think that's false teaching. If that's the God you serve, you're serving the wrong God. Somebody's taught you wrong. God knows what we're capable of. God knows that we are sinful creatures by nature. That's why He sent His Son. To bleed and die so that our relationship with Him could be fixed. Jesus didn't look upon Peter with eyes of condemnation and judgment. Jesus looked upon Peter with eyes of love. And Peter received the love of Christ. How do I know that Peter received the love of Christ? Because he wept. He wept bitterly. Peter received the love of Christ because it broke him. And he wept. Had Peter refused Jesus' love, his heart would have became hard. It would have became callous. He would have made excuses for his sin. He would have made excuses for his failure. He would have made excuses for his mistake. He would have said, I did it because. You fill in the blank. How many times have you said, I did it because? He would have blamed his mom. He would have blamed his dad. He would have blamed his wife. I'm just trying to make the message 
Do I know that Peter had a wife? I don't know. Do I know that Peter blamed his... Let's take Peter's name out of this and put your name in. How many times have you blamed your mom? How many times have you blamed your dad? How many times have you blamed your wife? How many times have you blamed your husband? How many times have you blamed your children? How many times have you blamed your boss? How many times have you blamed your job? How many times have you blamed busy schedules? How many times have you blamed circumstance? How many times have you blamed situation? How many times have you blamed it on this town that I'm living in and I just got to get out of here? How many times have you blamed it on you fill in the blank? That's what happens when you refuse the love of Jesus Christ. Your heart gets hard. Your heart gets cold. You start pointing a finger at everything else. Your heart gets hard. Your heart gets cold. You'll never receive the love of Christ because you have to see your need for a Savior before you receive the grace of God. You have to be able to say within your heart, listen, just, just man up, woman up, Say, I did this. And it ain't her fault. It ain't his fault. It ain't their fault. It's my fault. I distanced myself away from Jesus Christ and I wound up in a position I should have never been in. I did this. And I have to own it. I have to do something about it. What do I need to do? You need to receive the love of Jesus Christ. Peter's heart would have been cold had he refused, but he didn't. He wept, which tells me his heart was touched and, and, and his heart was softened and Peter wept before the Lord. That's another principle. Principle number two. You want to write this down. Receive the love of Christ for your own mistakes and for your own sins. Receive the love of Christ for your own sins and for your own mistakes. And the love of Christ will set you free. Do what you need to do to receive the truth of the love of Jesus Christ. What does the scripture say? Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you want to be free from this circumstance, if you want to be free from this situation, if you want to be free from the sin, if you want to be free from the mistake, if you want to be free from it, you need to receive the truth about it. And the truth about it is Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and He still loves you. Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to shout. Yes. Amen. There's hope. There's forgiveness. There's restoration. And all you have to do is quit fighting the love of Christ and receive it. Yes. Mm. Yes. Principle number three. And this is gonna this is gonna knock you out of the left field. I know it is. <laughs> Principle number three guilt Ow. is a holy thing. Now, wait a minute, preacher. I've always been taught that if I'm walking around in the spirit of guilt, that I need to declare to the Lord that I've been set free. You took my guilt, you took my shame, and so guilt is an unholy thing. Once again, you've been taught wrong. Guilt is a holy thing. When we do something wrong that we shouldn't do, and you feel that sense of guilt over that action? You want to know what that is? That's conviction from the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. That's God saying, I love you, child, and you should not have done that. And you just feel like, oh man, I've let the Lord down. That feeling of guilt is actually the convicting power of the Holy Ghost of God. You say, well, I'm there. I don't feel no guilt over that. Listen, if you ever in your life reach a point where you no longer feel the conviction power of the Holy Ghost of God, you've got bigger problems in your life than just these sins and mistakes that you've made and committed. That means you've gotten yourself so far away from God, He's no longer dealing with your heart, and you need to fall up your face before Jesus Christ. 
So when you feel that, con that convicting power, when you feel that guilt, that's your trigger to say, oh, I've gotten this wrong. And I need to weep before the Lord. That's what Peter did. Peter wept before the Lord. Guilt is a holy thing. Friend, don't push it away. Churches today teach against guilt. Using the scripture. Some of them will use that scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation to any man who is in Christ Jesus. So honey, if you're feeling guilt, uh, that goes against the word. Can I tell you? There is a big difference between the word guilt and condemnation. God doesn't condemn you. Jesus doesn't condemn you. The word doesn't condemn you. Your family doesn't condemn you. Your friends don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Nobody's condemning you. You're condemning yourself. You're being condemned by Satan. God doesn't condemn. Satan condemns. God forgives. But make no mistake. God will put a spirit of guilt upon your heart and, and soften you to the point where you weep before Him. And in that weeping, you repent and say, Lord, forgive me for I've sinned. And that forgiveness just washes upon you. Uh, and the Holy Spirit begins to minister to you and lifts you up and wipes off your eyes and hugs you and kisses your face and says, hear me today, child. I, I know you've committed sin. Oh my God, I feel like jumping in here. I know you've committed sin. I know that you've gotten it wrong. But I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son. Thanks. 
to go stop and turn around. Have you ever had a dog getting in your garbage cans? It just absolutely makes me mad in a heart, brother. I don't know why it is. I don't know how come it became a man's job to sack the trash and take it out anyhow, but it, it has. <laughs> and I can't stand to do something twice. So when I sack the trash and take it out, I want to be done with that bag of trash anyway. And to have some stray dog go down the alley and think, oh, Better trash and tear it all <laughs> Makes me mad in the morning. And have you ever picked up? I'm going to tell a story. Of you animal lovers just know I love dogs. I, I, I'm not mean to animals. But I have chucked a big old rock and a stray dog who's dragging garbage all over my back alley. And they'll run down the block two or three blocks away just like lightning. Woo! Take off. But they'll always stop and turn around. Uh, have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I got another smooth stuff. You ain't alive, buddy. <laughs> you know, that's what the devil does in your life. He'll torment you. He'll tear trash all over your life. If you remember the word of God and know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and you chuck that rock at him, he's going to run off. You resist the, Remember the word. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Remember the word. Remember the word and apply the word. Peter remembered the word and conviction fell and he wept and he was released. You need to remember the word and you need to apply the word. <laughs> but you need to also remember he's going to run two blocks away and stop and look. And eventually he'll be back around tearing trash up all over your life again. You ain't going to get it. Yeah, you are. One of these days when you take your last breath here on this earth, you'll take your first breath over home in glory. And you'll be delivered from that forever and ever and ever. Yes. But while you're alive in this world, Satan's going to keep on being that straight dog carrying trash all over. I know that's the country's thing I've ever talked to you about. That's just that's the best way I know how to, how to teach you. He's going to come back time and time again, carrying trash all over your yard. Yes. Remember the word. Remember the word. He'll run and he'll flee. Peter remembered the word. Satan will take your eyes off of the word, causing a feeling of despair, causing a feeling of no hope. But friend, the Bible will turn you back toward God. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible, one of my life verses is Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. <laughs> Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Don't let the devil's lies condemn you any longer. Amen. But let the truth of the Word of God set you free. I'm going to close. I mean that. Look here. I'm, I'm closing my Bible. Here. If you read just a little bit further in the Scripture, you're going to see after Jesus was buried, after He resurrected, He came and appeared in Peter and a couple others who were out fishing. Now, it blesses me to know that Peter's the one who denied Christ. And, he, and Christ, when He came back to these disciples, He, he set aside Peter. Do you, how many of you know what it means to be set aside? It means to be sanctified. There was a sanctification moment between Jesus Christ and Peter when Christ came back while they were fishing. Jesus said, children, have you caught anything? And they said, no. Cast your net over there this time. And they realized that it was Jesus. <coughs> Peter jumped out of the boat into the water and swam to shore. And Jesus had already had a fire burning with some fish there. He wanted a blessing. Peter denied him, but he wanted a blessing. And it blesses me to know that Peter denied him how many times? Three. And Jesus took Peter aside 
And he asked him once, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. And then Jesus asked him twice, Peter, lovest thou me? And he said, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to Peter, go feed my sheep. And then he asked him the third time, Peter denied him three times. Jesus confirmed three times yes. to Peter. Yes. Not to John, not to James, but to Peter. You know, Jesus has a way of dealing with your sin. Jesus has a way of dealing with your failure. Jesus has a way of dealing with your mistakes. He loves you personally. Yes. Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Peter said, Lord, you know all things. Surely you know that I love you. And in one of the most loving, tender moments in the scripture, Jesus set Peter free. Forget about what you did, Peter. Forget about the business that I've called you into. Feed my sheep. <laughs> Do you know Jesus doesn't love Peter more than he loves you? Oh yeah, he does. That's Peter. It does. He's no respecter person. He loves you as much as he loves Peter. The only excuse that you have for not getting set free and receiving restoration right here this morning is you. You're not ready to receive it. But when you are ready to receive it, it'll be there. There's hope for you. Amen. I feel like I preached my message. Let's rise for Let's bow our heads this morning and let's close our eyes. I want every head to be bowed. I want every head to be closed. Last week we had a victory here at the altar. This week we can have another. You can have that victory. But you have to be willing to let your heart be softened. Open your heart and receive the love of Christ. Is there one or more of you here today that would say, Pastor, Dad, I'm lost in my sin. I've never received Jesus Christ, and I want to be saved. I want God's grace to cover me. And I want to be forgiven of my sin. Is there one or more of you here this morning? Can I lead you in prayer? Can I lead you to that throne? Will you come? Will you humble yourself? Will you wait before the Lord? Maybe you are a child of God in Jesus Christ. For all you've gotten so wrong. You dropped the ball. You've, you've made a huge mistake. You've messed up. And it's causing problems on, on the job. It's causing problems in your home. It's causing problems in your own heart. And you just you just want to you just want to make this right. You know you're not lost. You're a child of God. But you're ready for this to be done. I want restoration. I want forgiveness. I want grace. I want mercy. Is there one or more of you here this morning? Let's say remember me, Pastor Dad. I see your hand. God bless you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Oh! Thank you, Lord. Father God, I come before you in the name of Jesus Christ this morning, and I thank you for your word. Your word is the truth. And I thank you for holy conviction power. It shows us when we're going wrong. It draws us before you. It allows our hearts to weep before you. 
as we repent and be made new. I thank you, Lord, for using me. It humbles me, really. Sometimes I, I wonder how I could possibly be the one that stands before these people. No. You know that. I just thank you, Lord. I just thank you for your leadership and guidance. Father, you see the hands. <coughs> 15, 20 of them raised up. They're facing some things this morning, Lord. Failure is being prayed over. Sin is being repented of. Mistakes are being made known. Their hearts are open. They're crying out to you. And I stand in agreement with each and every one of them. I know, Lord, that there's forgiveness. I know, Lord, that there's restoration. Touch my brothers and sisters this morning, Lord, is only the way that you can. And deliver them. Restore them. Love them. Heal them. Forgive them. And we'll give you the praise. Father, I love these people, each and every one, and I know that you do too. So I'm going to ask you once again, Lord, please keep them all safe from harm's way. Right? And bring us back to our next appointed time where once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise we'll give it to thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.